science, engineering, medicine, yes, chemistry, physics, biology, humanity, cardiology, computer, public health, global, science, communication, Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, Solar Orbiter and Contrails from Aircraft. Both of those are stories in our news section. Also in this edition, the race to develop a coronavirus vaccine. And we hear from one of the architects of the UN's sustainability goals. And also some advice, just in case you get caught up in a discussion where science finds itself being used to underpin a racist argument. Be aware of the fact that the foundations of race pseudoscience are still things that, that percolate into the modern age. Know your science. Understand about what genetics actually says about human variation, about human evolution. Writer and broadcaster Adam Rutherford tells us about his latest book. Right, well, let's kick off with some news. Hayley Dunning is here to get us started. And uh, Hayley, there's been an exciting space launch earlier this month. This is the Solar Orbiter, which is now on its way to the sun. So real excitement at Imperial because there's an instrument of ours on board. Yes, Imperial scientists and engineers built one of the instruments that launched on Solar Orbiter. Two of the people involved, Professor Tim Horbury and Helen O'Brien, who's the instrument manager, went out to Florida to watch the launch. And I just met them a few days afterwards and they said it was such a beautiful event and it was so wonderful to see their instrument go up into space. But that the relief didn't come immediately after launch. They still had to wait for the instrument to turn on and tell everyone that it was OK. And is the instrument OK? Yes, lucky for the team, their instrument was the first one to turn on. So it was actually just under 24 hours after launch. So Helen and Tim themselves were in a launch party run by NASA in Florida when their hard-working team back at Imperial actually got the first data and told them that the instrument seemed to be okay. So the first lot of data was just housekeeping data, the instrument saying, I'm alive. But um, a couple of days after that, they actually got their first science data. So this is showing that it's taking the measurements that it's supposed to be. So what is this instrument? So their instrument is a magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field. So the sun produces a magnetic field that fills the whole solar system. And this magnetic field is also carried along with what's called the solar wind, which is an important stream of particles from the sun. Both of these things can interact with the Earth and can cause some problems when they are in a violent mood and can also cause problems for astronauts and satellites. So it's important to study the solar wind and the magnetic field. Now, the team's instrument, the magnetometer, is actually out on a boom on the back of the spacecraft, and that's to isolate it from the spacecraft in case any of the instruments there have their own little magnetic fields that might interfere with the measurements. So these first science measurements were this boom being deployed, and they had, first they could, were measuring the spacecraft, and as it went away, they realised that what they were measuring was for the first time the solar wind. Well, that's quite a thought, isn't it? An Imperial instrument measuring the solar wind within days of the launch of that solar orbiter. Uh, Hayley Dunning, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, let's get a little bit closer to the Earth now, but still way off the ground. Caroline Brogan, uh, now you have some news about Imperial research into these things called contrails. Hi, Gareth. So contrails, you might know or you might not know, are the fluffy white streaks left behind in the sky by aeroplanes. And it turns out that these contrails aren't actually great for the environment. They contain little particles of black carbon, which are clung to by vapours in the air to create this visual spectacle that they are. But they're actually pretty bad for the environment. So where does this new imperial research come in? So... Imperial researchers from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering looked at how they could mitigate the climate effect of these contrails. So they ran some computer simulations based on flight data from Japan's airspace. And what they found is that if they tweaked the altitude by only around 2,000 feet for each plane, the plane would release fewer contrails and therefore would be easier on the environment. And they say that by tweaking by only around 2,000 feet upwards or downwards, they could reduce the effects of contrails by about 59%. Well, I guess the researchers must have been pretty surprised at what a big difference a relatively small change in altitude would have made. Yeah, so what's also surprising is that only around 2% of flights fly in this 
specific altitude that creates the most contrails. So it was actually relatively easy for them to say, well, if we take these 2% of flights and tweak those instead of making load of flights a different altitude, they could have such a big effect. Obviously, this is only a simulation study, so it's not in real life yet, but it could have implications for the future of the aviation industry and its impact on the climate. Well, that's great. Caroline Brogan, thanks for that. And you also heard there from Hayley Dunning. Well, now, it really is a race against time. As the coronavirus, now known as COVID-19, continues to spread, the hunt is on to develop a vaccine and to develop that vaccine quickly. One of those on the front line is Professor Robin Shattuck of Imperial's Department of Infectious Diseases. He and his team are part of an international effort using the latest technology to tackle the virus. Ryan O'Hare has been speaking to Robin and finding out how COVID-19 relates to other influenza viruses. This is interesting because it is related to SARS, but it's different. So SARS was quite pathogenic and it killed quite a number of people, but it was really spread very inefficiently. And one of the reasons is that people weren't infectious until they developed symptoms, so they could be quarantined very easily. The slightly alarming thing about this current outbreak is that the virus seems to be transmitted from person to person before they develop any symptoms. And so in terms of trying to physically control the epidemic by identifying people and quarantining them, that makes it a a really big challenge, which is probably why it's spreading much faster. It has a lower fatality rate than SARS, but because it's infecting many more people, we're seeing a higher number of deaths. There's been talk of a a global race to find a a vaccine, and your team is one of the few within this race. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's exciting. Obviously, we'd prefer it not to be exciting and not to have the problem, but we have the kind of technology to be able to generate a vaccine with a speed that's never been realized before. So most vaccines would take you know, maybe five years in the discovery phase and, and at least one to two years to manufacture and get into clinical trials. We're trying to short track that. So a month from sequence to a candidate in animal trials. And we have the potential to get that into human trials within four months. So we've gone from like a two-year cycle to four months, never been done before. We're one of a number of groups that, that are trying these kind of strategies. The vaccine that your group is developing, how is this different to the sort of vaccines people would have had as children? It's really quite different. So modern vaccines now are made using nucleic acid. So people will be familiar with DNA. And DNA encodes RNA, which is called the message. And that's essentially the blueprint in the cell for making proteins. So we're shortcutting the whole process and making RNA as a vaccine. That gets injected into somebody's muscle and then their muscle itself makes the vaccine. And that makes the whole process really quick because we're making the RNA by a synthetic process which is very different to conventional vaccines, which usually require you growing a virus in huge litres of cell culture and purifying it, or if it's influenza, growing it in you know, millions of eggs. So it's really, really smart technology. It's exciting to be working in that space. How soon could a vaccine actually be available for people to use? That's an important question. And in some ways, it's a little bit sobering against how fast this epidemic is moving. So if we moved as fast as we possibly can, and we had all the funding to do that, we would be testing it in humans for the first time towards the summer. But that just tests whether it's safe and whether it induces the right immune response. The next phase would be to test it in a a live situation to see if it blocks natural infection. That would probably start to occur towards the end of the winter, with the vaccine being made available to wider populations early next year. Now, all things can change depending on how this epidemic turns out. It might all have been and gone in a few months. That would be wonderful. Or we might see that there's a major pandemic that's growing and that might even accelerate the pace at which the globe is trying to do this. And it's important to remember we're only one party here. And it may be that at some point we you know, say, actually, somebody else is ahead of us. We should stop working so that people can focus on that approach. 
Is this the future of vaccines or is there a potential drawback against conventional vaccines? So I think this is definitely the future for these kind of outbreaks of viruses. And we are already looking much more to the future, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, where we would hope that this ability to synthesize vaccines quickly could be established, you know, in every country in the world. So instead of, you know, a few centers, as soon as there's an outbreak, everyone everywhere could access a vaccine. So that we're really ready because although this is a very serious threat, it's still not as serious as a new influenza pandemic. Robin Shattuck speaking there to Ryan O'Hare. And on the subject of COVID-19, the co-director of Imperial's Institute of Global Health Innovation has called on the international community to prioritise cooperation over conflict as the world faces up to the coronavirus outbreak. Professor David Nabarro has been speaking about his role in creating the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Professor Nabarro is previously Special Advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Stephen Johns of Communications and Public Affairs here at Imperial has been speaking to David about his role in developing those SDGs. The Sustainable Development Goals emerged from the experience of countries that started in 2012 when they were reviewing what has been the progress with development against certain indicators since 2000. I was involved in that process of analysis in 2012 and then the dialogue between governments between 2012 and 2015. My particular area of focus was to do with food and nutrition, and in particular the reduction of hunger. How much progress do you think we've made so far? There are six goals that very much relate to people. They're to do with health, food and hunger reduction, education, water and sanitation, and perhaps centrally in this also gender equality and poverty reduction. We've actually, as a world, done quite well in reducing overall poverty figures and, until recently, in reducing hunger. These are slipping back a bit because of the number of wars that are taking place and also because of the impact of climate change, which is creating new challenges. The second set of goals are more about economic development. There's one on access to energy. There's another on work and jobs There's one on industry and infrastructure. There's one on cities and and communities and their sustainability. And then, perhaps most importantly, inequalities. There, I think we've got much, much more work to do. But there are some really good signs as a result of the work of mayors. A number of cities have really transformed the way in which they're evolving. And there's the beginning of a recognition in, in the industry sector Energy has to be clean. And there's also a recognition that the future of work is critical, with more and more and more young people coming onto the labour market. It's no good saying to them, sorry, your job's been taken over by a robot. There is a lot of progress, but a lot more to do. Then there's a third group of goals. These are mostly about the environment. Perhaps these are the ones that are causing extraordinary concern at the moment because of a real anxiety that we're reaching what some people describe as tipping points on the relationship between people, the environment and climate. And there has been some shift. The big movement on plastics recently is a sign of this. But I would say if people want to know where is the real anxiety zone, it's goals 12, 13, 14 and 15. Goal 16 is super important as well. This is the one that's about conflict. And basically it says conflict normally should be resolved through peaceful means, through diplomacy, through the establishment of good quality political action. We should only regress into our fortresses and go to war when everything else has failed. And in fact, most of us believe that there is virtually no justification for warfare. It's not what all leaders seem to be thinking at the moment. There's a certain tendency to get a bit bellicose in situations and try to use violence as a means to resolve conflict. So I actually pick out goal 16 and I say we all of us need to get much better at non-violent means for conflict resolution. How concerned are you by our ability to cope with major disasters and pandemics like the Australian fires or coronavirus? 
and the impact they might have on our ability to achieve the goals. We are right in the middle of an outbreak of a major health challenge, which is the novel coronavirus. We certainly have the science that can tell us how best to respond to a threat like this. We have the business capability to develop solutions like vaccines. The question is always, is there the political willingness to work together as a community of nations to make sure that the suffering associated with a new outbreak is as small as possible? If I have a plea, it is this is an area where high quality cooperation between governments is the only way in which human suffering can be reduced. Please could everybody involved when dealing with this kind of threat try to put political differences aside. David Nabarro speaking there to Stephen Johns. And you can hear a longer version of that interview. It'll be up in just a few days, accompanying Stephen's news article about Professor Nabarro and the SDGs. In fact, the news website and Imperial's SoundCloud channel are the places to go for more on all the other stories in this podcast. There are extended versions of all of them, including that earlier coronavirus piece and the Adam Rutherford interview that we're about to hear. How to argue with a racist the provocative title of the new book from the science writer, broadcaster and author Adam Rutherford, who's been at Imperial recently talking about the book and how bigotry shifts its axis according to the prevailing culture. And that's to steal a quote from Adam's talk. In his lecture here, Adam said that the book should be a tool to confront racism, especially when science is used to underpin racist arguments. The book has just been serialised by BBC Radio 4, where Adam also presents the programme Inside science. After his imperial talk, Adam sat down with Martha Nahar. From your book, it's clear you understand that racism is a social phenomenon, but that when science is warped, misrepresented or abused to justify hatred and prejudice, it must be challenged. So how can people actually challenge it? By knowing the science, by knowing the history, by recognising that there are whole branches of science on which modern science is based that we that many people are just unaware of that the initial classifiers of taxonomy of humans that occurs in the 17th and 18th century are almost entirely based on pigmentation made by men who never traveled who never encountered the people of the world and with those were associated cultural and behavioral traits now just knowing what for example Linnaeus or Voltaire said about the various races, and I use sort of air quotes when I say that in reference to those guys, knowing what they said in the 17th and 18th centuries about the races of of the world, it's very easy to mock because they're absurd and they're, they're ridiculous. And yet many of the things that they did say are the basis of stereotypes and myths that exist within society today. The idea that white people are industrious and wealth generators and gentle and beautiful, which is what Linnaeus described white people as. The notion that black people are uh, capricious or lazy or that Asians are greedy and haughty and so on. These are things written by the founding fathers of this endeavour that we're in, science, whose work is incredibly important and some of which we can discount as being absurd now. Nevertheless, just simply to be aware of the fact that the foundations of race pseudoscience are still things that that percolate into the modern age. Know your science. Understand the history of where the sciences that we work in today, where their evolutionary origins are. Because they're intrinsically linked with empire, with the subjugation of people, with the age of plunder, with the age of exploitation, at a time when sciences or new sciences are being co-opted in order to justify an ideology. Simply knowing that is an important tool in combating the, the stereotypes that many of us, including people who at least don't think of themselves as overt racists, but still hold these views which are ascientific and ahistorical. In your book, you touch on conscious and unconscious biases in science. So how do these biases manifest themselves? For example, the fact that we use huge genomic data sets in order to claim experimental evidence for all sorts of things to do with genetics, with human genetics, with human variation and human evolution and so on. But those data sets are heavily skewed in particular directions. 
And the researchers may or may not be aware of those skews, nor even the fact that those, those biases exist in a historical context. So, for example, we know much more about the genetics of Europeans than we do of any other people of the Earth. There's multiple reasons for that, one of which is that lots of human genetics has been done in Europe. But it's also built upon the fact that we are, in Europe, culturally biased towards Europeans. Now, the irony of that, there's more biological diversity within Africa than there is in the rest of the world put together, a fact which betrays our African origins as, as a species. And yet only in the last few years have we begun looking at the genomics of people in Africa, 1.3 billion people over 54 countries. And so we base a lot of judgments or experimental data or, or whatever the outcome of looking at something from a scientific point of view, from data sets which are inherently skewed because of the way that they've been, that they've been generated, which isn't necessarily a wrong thing as long as you are aware of that. So we say, OK, we looked at the 100,000 Genome Project to look for markers to do with whatever disease. But the researchers know that, and, and we call that a, a predominantly European or even Caucasian, which is a word that we're sort of beginning to rule out because it's sort of non-scientifically useful. But even within that, the researchers know that it's not a European-wide because we have to discount Finnish people and Sardinians um, because they're genetically slightly unusual and so they would skew the results. And we might disclude Icelanders as well for the same reasons and, and various other skews within that. And yet when we report it or when we talk about it, when we write it up in the paper, it says Europeans, which is a sort of slightly, it's not meaningless, but it's a data set which requires heavy qualification. The, the, one of the phrases I use in the book is that, you know, this maxim that we stand on the shoulders of giants is incredibly important, a foundational principle of the scientific endeavor. But we have to remember as well that we also stand on the shoulders of a bunch of people who were ideologically driven, pseudoscientists, and racists from, from the past. And I don't mean that sort of judging them by contemporary standards, but that they were unequivocally racist in a factual sense. And we need, as scientists, to be aware of that history, that, that many of the stereotypes and myths, and many of the social practices within the sciences, are based on 500 years' worth of structural and systemic racism. Adam Rutherford speaking there to Martha Nahar, which rounds it off for this edition. Just before I go, just the usual reminders, that there are plenty of ways of accessing this podcast. So pick your favourite. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube and SoundCloud. And for visual podcasting, which we think is really cool, then go to Entail. So that's a platform called Entail. Do check that out. And whilst you're doing that, we'll have a little think about what to bring you in the next edition. Yes, I'll be back with more next month. So from me, Gareth Mitchell... And all of us on the podcast team, thanks for listening and goodbye.